We're returning this evening to the study of Elisha, the successor of Elijah, a main prophet, maybe the most outstanding prophet of the Old Testament. I want to think with you this evening regarding Elisha being in the middle, but not at the center. Being in the middle, but not at the center. A reflection of the understanding of, or his understanding of his place in the purposes of God. He served the purposes of God for 50 years, five decades, over the course of six kings. He spoke for God and he worked for God during these men's reign and during a very dark time in the history of Israel. He warned of and observed, watched the decline of God's people to the point of the captivity, the sacking of Jerusalem. Elisha faithfully occupied his place in God's purposes, yet he maintained his role as in the middle, but not at the center. The introduction of Elisha came in 1 Kings chapter number 19, and we studied that out in verses 19 to 21. The focus of that, those three verses, was Elisha's statement after the mantle of Elijah was cast on him, I will follow thee, he said. I will follow thee. We then turn to 2 Kings chapter number 2, and we saw repeated in verse number 2, and verse number 4, and verse number 6, I will not leave thee. This is some 10 years later when Elijah is taken away in a chariot of fire. I will follow thee, initiated the relationship. I will not leave thee, came at the end of the relationship. Tying those two together, we might say that the defining element of Elisha's life was this element of surrender. He was surrendered to serve the Lord. His commitment to his predecessor Elijah was also his commitment to Jehovah. His following him, his discipleship for those 10 years was a following of Jehovah's call on his life. His commitment at the end was a picking up or taking up of the mantle of Elijah as God's main prophet, the prophet who stood before Israel, before kings, as a testimony of God's heart, God's word. He was a simple farmer, but he was ready to serve. And he made a break with his earlier vocation when he was called of God by Elijah. He honored his family and friends. He sacrificed the animals with which he was plowing. He used the uh, materials, the instruments of plowing to build a fire and to prepare a feast for them. He honored them and then he said goodbye. He made a break with his earlier vocation. He honored his family and friends as he followed God. And he ministered as a disciple, embraced his role for those 10 years as a disciple of Elijah. Simple beginnings and unquestioning surrender was our focus of that first study. Simple beginnings and unquestioning surrender. Necessary for all of us. Thought-provoking as we look at our lives over the course of the years in which we've known the Lord, but also a way in which we might examine where we find ourselves today as individuals. Simple beginnings unquestioning surrender. Does that characterize my life? Does that describe my spirit? In the middle, seeking to be in the middle of what God is doing, but never occupying that place at the center. Our second study was entitled God's Man for His Day. And we followed out the beginnings of Elisha's ministry as he stood for Jehovah representing Jehovah. We gave thought to the fact that he's standing for the unseen Lord. He's speaking for the unseen Lord. He's God's instrument of righteousness that tells the people what they need to hear, tells the king what he needs to hear. He speaks reality 
he shines his light in dark days with certainty and conviction. Not an apologetic word, but a thus saith the Lord word. He trusted judgment to the Lord. He prophesied that judgment would come, but he left the Lord to judge individuals and kings and nations. So again, he was in the middle of what God was doing, but he was not at the center. He requested a double portion of Elijah's spirit. He knew of his need. If he was to occupy this role, he knew that he needed the spirit of God. He, he knew that he needed the power of God, the energy of God to serve the Lord effectively. I would suggest that the Old Testament heroes of, of the faith were fundamentally God-centered. Those Old Testament heroes were fundamentally God-centered. I would suggest as well that when they did drift, it was only when they drifted from the centrality of Jehovah that they floundered. Let me state that again and ask you to think through it with me. Old Testament heroes of the faith were fundamentally God-centered. And it was only when they drifted from the centrality of the Lord that they floundered. We see that true in Noah's day. The testimony of this patriarch as he stood for 120 years. He was a preacher of righteousness as he built this ark, but that later he floundered. Abraham and Sarah both stood with the Lord when they lived and thought and operated in a God-centered way. They did well, but when they began to take things into their own hands, when they began to reason as to their responses and hardship, those were times when they drifted. When the Lord was not central, they floundered. Moses. Along with Moses, you have Aaron and Miriam. God-centered, fundamentally. But only as they drifted from that God-centeredness did they flounder. In our study, we have the man Elisha before us, and we want to think in terms of being in the middle, but not at the center. That's a crucial reference point for life and for ministry. When we turn to 2 Kings, we observe the ongoing purposes of God in the writings of what we have called and what is rightly called historical narrative. First and Second Kings were originally one book. The explanation for them being two books practically is the capacity of a scroll. If you were going to use a scroll, the capacity would not allow that you would have the full First and Second Kings recorded together. In my Bible, the one that's not a study Bible, but just the strict text of this, of these two books, First Kings occupies 28 pages and Second Kings occupies 25 pages. So in a practical way, they're divided because of the capacity of the scroll in that day. But secondly, there's a natural transition that takes place at the end of First Kings and into Second Kings, and that's a transition between Elijah and Elisha. There are seven chapters given to Elijah, and there are six chapters given to Elisha, and they overlap. But if we zoom out further, we think in terms of the content of First and Second Kings as a whole, and this gives us the right reference point into what God is doing in granting us this record. First and Second Kings as a whole move from the late days or the latter days of David's reign all the way forward to the captivity. The content of these two books is over 400 years of Israel's history. The kingdom is united under David. David's task before God as, again, another man that was in the middle but not at the center, was as a conqueror. David's role was that of a military might. From the time that he uh, 
was used of the Lord to slay Goliath to the time that he turned his kingdom over to Solomon. That was David's role. God had that role for him. Well, Solomon came in and his role was to build a temple. His role was to give organization and guidance to Israel as a whole. And he did that. And yet in Solomon's reign, we had the beginning of idolatry. So in that 400 plus span of years, we have the conquering might of a David. And then you have the beginning of idolatry, the beginnings of idolatry with this man, Solomon. And from that point forward, we know the kingdom was divided. And so as we make our way through First and Second Kings, we see the Lord's work with his covenant people and the nations around. We see Judah and Israel. We have the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom. We see those final days before the captivity. So you have different kings that are ruling from Samaria. If you're part of the northern kingdom from Jerusalem, if you're part of the southern kingdom, you have Israel and Judah running side by side. And you have the sacking of Israel, whose capital was at Samaria in 722. And then in 586, we have the sacking of Jerusalem. 586 is a date that's well known to many. In the midst of this was this prophetic office where these prophets spoke for the Lord. In the midst of all of this history of these 400 plus years, you have spiritual concerns. And that is what the office of the prophet is taken up with. Now, these prophets were involved in military things. These prophets were involved in putting military things or physical things or national things or political things in a spiritual context. Let me show you that, please. If you turn over to Second Kings chapter number 17, we're going to be back in chapter 3 for our time together this evening. But I want to show you this, and I want to keep this in front of us, because if we don't see the whole portrait, if we don't see all that's happening here, if we don't get the underpinning, if we don't uh, understand that the underlying issue here is the covenant relationship that God has established with his people and the covenant unfaithfulness of God's people and the covenant faithfulness of Jehovah as the God of these people. Notice it in 2 Kings chapter number 17. We'll pick up our reading at verse 7. This is 2 Kings 17 verse 7. For it so it was that the children of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, which had brought them up out of the land of Egypt. It reminds you of God's redemptive work, and it shows you the unfaithfulness of God's people. Continue from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and had feared other gods, and walked in the statues. Listen to what Israel's doing. They've sinned against the Lord. By doing so, they reverence other gods. Verse number eight, they walked in the statutes of the heathen, whom the Lord cast out from before the children of Israel and of the kings of Israel, which they had made. And the children of Israel did secretly those things that were not right against the Lord their God. And they built them high places in all their cities from the tower of the watchman to the fenced city. And they set them up images and groves in every high hill and under every green tree. And there they burn incense in all the high places, as did the heathen whom the Lord carried away before them and wrought wicked things to provoke the Lord to anger. For they served idols, verse 12 says, whereof the Lord had said to them, you shall not do this thing. Yet the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah. How? By all the prophets. There it is. And by all the seers saying. So the Lord is pleading with them in the midst of all this. Turn ye from evil ways, your evil ways, and keep my commandments and my statutes according to all the law which I commanded your fathers, which I sent to you by my servants, the prophets. So in verse number 13, 
the record is that God used prophets to connect back again to the Torah, to the law of God, to that first five books of the Old Testament, to this narrative and the work of the prophets, the ministry of the prophets is, is an application of the law of God to the people of God. It's the application of the covenant of God to the people of God. It has a reference point. God had spoken in his covenant commitment to these people. God had spoken to them as to what his, his requirements were for them as the redeemed people that belonged to him. But verse 14 says, notwithstanding, they would not hear, but harden their necks like to the neck of their fathers. They did not believe in the Lord their God. There it is. No faith led to no obedience. Verse 15, and they rejected his statutes and his covenant that he made with their fathers and his testimonies, which he testified against them. They ignored that. They followed vanity and became vain and went after the heathen that were round about them concerning whom the Lord had charged them that they should not do like them. Again, verse 16, they left all the commandments of the Lord their God and made them molten images, even two calves, made a grove and worshiped all the host of heaven and they served Baal. There was calf worship. There was the, the worship of astrology, the worship of the heavens, the created things, and worship of Baal. Verse 17 goes further. They caused their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire, and used divination and enchantments, and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Therefore, the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them out of his sight. There was none left but the tribe of Judah only. And Judah kept not the commandments of the Lord their God and walked in the statutes of Israel, which they made. So now we move into the southern kingdom. And again, Judah didn't keep God's commandments either. And the Lord rejected all the seed of Israel and afflicted them and delivered them into the hand of spoilers until he had cast them out of his sight. There's the captivity. There's the record of the book of Kings. For he rent Israel from the house of David. That's where first Kings starts. And they made Jeroboam the son of Nebat king. And Jeroboam drove Israel from following the Lord and made them sin a great sin. So following, following Solomon's reign, and God puts his finger on Jeroboam here. For the children of Israel, verse number 22, walked in all the sins of Jeroboam, which he did. They departed not from them. What happened? Well, verse number 23, the Lord removed Israel out of his sight, as he had said, by all his servants, the prophets. Well, there we go. There's our prophets. There's Elijah. There's Elisha. There's Isaiah. There's others. So was Israel carried away out of their own land to Assyria unto this day. The Assyrian captivity, the Babylonian captivity is connected to the spiritual rebellion, the spiritual uh, situation in Israel and in Judah. So we have a historic record that tells us about God's faithfulness to Israel, his covenant promises. But they tell us as well that the blessing and the judgment are contingent upon Israel abiding in God's law. That's what the prophet's doing. That's what the prophet's role is. It shows us the final decades of Israel as a monarchy. There's various kings and there's various nations. There's the division between Israel and the northern um, kingdom and Judah in the southern kingdom. In fact, the first 11 chapters of 2 Kings, uh, we see uh, Israel in chapters 12 through 25 of 2 Kings, going to go back to Judah. And then there's some back and forth that helps us get a sense of what's going on in the northern kingdom, what's going on in the southern kingdom. But at the end, they're both spiritually and faithful to God, and they both are carried away by God into captivity. So there's attention given to the prophets of God, their activities and their experiences. They are the interpreters of the historic record in terms of the Torah of God, the changeless one who's at the helm, who's in the center. Elisha stands as a testimony of these prophets. In the middle, 
meaning in the middle of what God's doing, but not at the center. And that is a good description of their role as prophets, as seers, as the spokesman for God. So first of all this evening, let's be reminded that faithful prophets understand the centrality of the Lord, be it persons that were prophets in the Old Covenant, be it the prophets of the New Testament before we had the scriptures, or be it the prophets of our day and every generation between the apostles in our day and every generation after our day. Those that are faithful spokesmen for God, that are faithful prophets, they understand the centrality of the Lord. And their whole life and ministry is wrapped up in the Lord's person. The Lord's person. That's the task of the prophet. Proclaim the person of the Lord. The Lord's covenant. Old covenant, new covenant. The prophets of these covenant are, covenants are communicators of the centrality of the Lord. His law that dominates the writings that are before us in First and Second Kings. The centrality of his person, the centrality of his covenant, the centrality of his law. Faithful prophets understand the centrality of the Lord. The prophetic word, as we see it in these texts, is always anchored in the Mosaic law. And as such, Elisha would be one of those model prophets. The people of God exist for the glory and purposes of God. The prophet continues to bring God's people back to this reality. The people of God exist for the glory and purposes of God. This is true in every generation. When we read the New Testament and it talks about the people of God, the church of God in our day, we are reminded over and over again that we exist for the glory and purposes of God. So whether we're dealing with times of blessing or times of judgment, whether we're dealing with times of revival and excitement or dealing with times of coldness and departure and hardness toward God. We exist for the glory and purpose of God, and that is the underpinning. We are those who exalt the Lord Jesus Christ, and our responses to life today are to be responses that attest to the glory and purposes of God. We are a created people. We are a redeemed people. And we are instructed as a created and redeemed people. We are blessed. Or we are judged. Based upon whether or not our lives are lived for his glory. The question that is before us each and every day. It's the same question that was before Elisha and Israel and Judah and Elijah and the people of old. Is God glorified? And are his purposes being advanced? Is God glorified? Are his purposes being advanced? Another way of thinking of this is, is God being magnified in my life? And are his priorities my priorities. We do well to start every day with that question. We do well to pray that before the Lord morning, noon, and night. Have you been glorified in my life today, Lord? To be honest in the application of the details of my life, to say, have the details of my life truly functioned under that umbrella purpose of glorifying God and advancing his purposes. The people of God exist for the glory and purposes of God. Secondly, the Canaanite presence, we can think about that in the sense of the world in our day, the Canaanite presence and influence is, has always been a factor. Faithful prophets understand the centrality of the Lord. The people of God exist for the glory and purposes of God. And the Canaanite presence and influence is always a factor. False gods and earthly agendas. Their presence and influence. False gods and earthly agendas. Canaanite altars 
and Canaanite appetites. Pagan rulers. In Elisha's day, pagan rulers. We might call them major players, these pagan rulers. These unfaithful kings, major players. But also uh, insignificant, seemingly insignificant participants in Elisha's story. Needy widows occupy a place in the Elisha story. Those that are high and those that are low. Those that are powerful and those that are powerless. We're going to see those in the Elisha story. Major players and seemingly insignificant participants. True today as well. The Canaanite presence and influence is always a factor. Is God glorified? Are his purposes being advanced? Is God my reference point for all of life? No matter who it is. In Elisha's day, matters of state, but also simple daily provisions. The Canaanite presence and influence is always a factor. Thirdly, the word of the Lord is the touchstone. It's a touchstone. It's a stone by which metals are examined. It's a black, smooth, glossy stone by which metals are examined. But touchstone is also a word that's used as any test or any criterion by which the qualities of a thing are tried or tested. Any test or criterion by which the qualities of a thing are tried. And so for the prophets and for Judah and Israel, the law of God specifically was the touchstone. The point is, would you experience the blessing of God? What's the touchstone for that? How do we measure whether or not we are experiencing the blessing of God? If we're Israel, if we're Judah, if we're those prophets speaking to Israel or Judah, we're going to have a touchstone in the Torah, the law of God. That's what I read to you from 2 Kings 17. The, the standard, right? The touchstone, the standard for belief and behavior is the law of God. For example, when judgment is spoken by the prophets, it's spoken in reference to the law of God. When blessing is spoken about by the prophets, it's spoken about in reference to the law of God. If judgment is delayed, the reference point is the law of God. If there's respite, it's reference to the word of God. When prophecies are given, it's the law of God that is used as the reference point. So Elisha is in the middle, but he's not at the center. And he's a testimony to us that faithful prophets understand the centrality of the Lord. The people of God exist for the glory and purposes of God. And the Canaanite presence and influence is always a factor for the people of God. And the word of the Lord is always the touchstone for that which is right and that which is wrong. So now we turn to 2 Kings chapter 3, and we follow out the storyline of Israel's apostasy. Notice the first three verses in 2 Kings chapter 3. Now Jehoram the son of Ahab, so it gives us a reference point. We have Ahab's son here. It began to reign over Israel, that is the, the, the northern kingdom, in Samaria. That's the uh, capital of the northern kingdom. The 18th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. So this connects him to that southern kingdom and that southern king, Jehoshaphat. And he reigned 12 years. So Jehoram, the son of Ahab, reigned for 12 years. He reigned in Israel, that is the capital city of Samaria. At the same time, Jehoshaphat is reigning in Jerusalem, that is the capital of the southern kingdom. Now, we studied Jehoshaphat. He was a revivalist. He was a faithful king. But the one black eye, we might say, in the life of Jehoshaphat was Four times it's recorded that he compromised uh, 
by joining what we might call an unholy alliance uh, with either pagan kings or the king of Israel who is not being faithful to God. So he, he had these unholy alliances with pagan kings and with idolatrous kings in Israel. That was the black eye for Jehoshaphat. But he's introduced here. The story's being told. But notice where the story starts in regards to Jehoram. Verse number two, he wrought evil in the sight of the Lord, but not like his father. So he wasn't as bad as Ahab and Jezebel and like his mother. For he put away the image of Baal that his father had made. So verse number two starts out the picture, the picture of where the king of Israel presently is. Now, he's not like Ahab and Jezebel. Now, Jezebel is still living. Jezebel still has influence. And how unlike them he is, is stated in the last statement of verse number two. He took away the image of Baal that his father had made. So he takes that image out of Samaria. He takes the image of Baal out of the focal point. But verse number three tells us, the evil in the sight of the Lord that existed in this present king, Jehoram. Verse 3, nevertheless, he cleaved unto the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. You remember, he started out this division of God's kingdom. He made Israel to sin, it says in verse 3. And it says of Jehoram that he departed not therefrom. Now, the sin of Jeroboam was worship of the calves, not, not a Baal worship, but a worship of the calves. And so as the storyline continues in 2 Kings chapter 3, we're reminded that the new king uh, is spiritually an idolater. He held on to and fostered the calf worship of Jeroboam. Instead of worshiping the one true God in the way in which the one true God communicates, instructs, guides that he might be witnessed, that he might be worshiped, that he might be witnessed to by the worship of his people. Actually, the problem with Jehoram as well was that he allowed Baal worship to continue, and we're going to see that later. Well, verse number four and forward, uh, return to the rebellion of Moab. Now, Moab is mentioned back in uh, verse number one of Second Kings. We read, then Moab rebelled against Israel after the death of Ahab. So we've already been given a heads up to the fact that Moab is going to rebel. Moab was put in subjection under David. So you get a full picture here. David begins first kings and he he's a testimony of military might and he has led israel to occupy uh, canaan and he has put down rebellions and one of those rebellions would be moab and moab is pretty much left to itself ahab leads israel into this idolatrous pattern of apostasy to such a degree that none other has led them his son comes on the scene now, and it says of him that he doesn't go as far as his dad did, but that he allowed that calf worship that had actually been part of dividing Israel under Jeroboam. He allowed that to continue and fostered that. Well, the storyline picks up in verse number four and says, Misha, this is chapter three and verse four, Misha, king of Moab. We're brought back to the storyline of Moab, was a sheep master and rendered unto the king of Israel a hundred thousand lambs and a hundred thousand rams with the wool. And it came to pass, verse 5 says, when Ahab was dead, that the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. And King Jehoram went out of Samaria the same time and numbered all Israel. So he is gathering Israel together, the northern kingdom, to do battle with Moab. Moab's rebelling. Notice verse 7, and he went and sent to Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, saying, The king of Moab hath rebelled against me. Wilt thou go with me against Moab to battle? Now, Moab would be a common enemy of both the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Okay, uh, 
Moab presented problems for the southern kingdom. So it's a good opportunity for Judah, Jehoshaphat, uh, really to uh, settle some things, settle a score, keep Moab in their right place. So what did Jehosh Jehoshaphat say? Second part of verse seven. And he said, I will go up. I am as thou art, my people as thy people, and my horses as thy horses. Problem being, Jehoshaphat was not leading Judah in idolatry, and Jehoram was leading Israel into idolatry. So verse number eight continues the story, and he said, which way shall we go up? And he answered, the way through the wilderness of Edom. Let me explain that a little bit. That would be an approach from the south. That would be a most a more difficult approach, but it would also be a surprise approach to Moab. And so the idea logically is, let's go down around the south and come up that way. We won't have to deal with those that occupy the northern area, and we'll kind of surprise Moab by coming from the south. So verse number nine continues, the king of Israel went, that's Jehoram, and the king of Judah, that is Jehoshaphat, and the king of Edom, that is that area that they're going to pass through, and they went the way of Edom, okay? And that really would be the singular option, because the rebels did not occupy, but did occupy the other routes. The northern route was occupied by the Syrians, so they couldn't go that route. So they approached from the south, but that's going to be a difficult way, but it's also an unexpected way. Moab wouldn't expect that. So, verse number nine continues after the colon, they fetched a compass of seven days' journey. And then he immediately tells us there's a problem here. There was no water for the host and for the cattle that followed them. Well, that was the devastating thing for an army. We have three armies here, really overwhelming numbers that could go in and take Moab. But we're aware of the fact there's spiritual problems going on here. There's apostasy and idolatry going on in the northern kingdom, and Jehoshaphat and the southern kingdom are cooperating in a military expedition with these idolaters, as well as with the Edomites. Some have called this what might be a cursed wilderness wandering. And that's what, there's no water, not for this host of warriors, nor for the cattle, that followed them. Verse number 10, the king of Israel said, Alas, that the Lord hath called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. Now listen to Jehoram, the king of Israel. He surmises that God is judging the three kings and the three kingdoms. But Jehoshaphat, verse number 11, who's being faithful to the Lord as far as leading Judah, he said, is there not here a prophet? Now, here's where uh, Elisha enters. Is there not a prophet of the Lord that we may inquire of the Lord by him? Well, one of the king of Israel's servants, one of Jehoram's servants answered and said, here is Elisha, the son of Shaphat which poured water on the hands of Elijah. What a statement. We have a good plan coming around the south, but we have a disobedient people, Israel. And we have a good king of Judah at this point who knows to seek the Lord. And so he says, is there not a prophet? Jehoshaphat understands we need a word from the Lord. So we've seen that Elisha's not at the center, though he's in the middle of the things that God is doing. And we are reminded that faithful prophets understand the centrality of the Lord. But secondly, this evening, we see that Elisha the prophet is brought forward typically in times of crisis. Now, we're going to follow his story through chapters 3 all the way through chapter 8. And we're going to see time and time again that the reference point is seek out the prophet of God. He's in the middle of these things, but he's not at the center of these things. We need a word from the Lord. Elisha the prophet is brought forward typically, we're going to watch his life as our next character study, in times of crisis. We noted here, and note here, that the judgment is, 
of God seems to be expected by Israel's king. Verse number 10, Jehoram basically says God is doing this. It's as if he expects divine judgment because of his disobedience. It's as if he is aware that he needs to repent and lead Israel to repent, but he's not going to do that. Even though he recognizes that God is central in this. God's holy demands are known by this king and by Israel, but idolatry is what they are choosing. Idolatry is their choice. The role of the prophet in these military campaigns is to give guidance to the kings, but it's also to confront the spiritual condition of these kings that leads them into these times of judgment. In verse number 11, Elisha is described as one who poured water. Last statement of verse 11, he poured water on the hands of Elijah. Well, there's no Old Testament parallel to this, and so we're left a little bit to wonder, wonder what's going on here. The rabbinic tradition claims uh, that Elisha was with Elijah at M Mount Carmel in 1 Kings chapter 18. But more probable, what we have here is a simple description of the daily ministry that Elisha had to his predecessor, Elijah. In this case, Elisha is close by. He's available by the providence of God. And Jehovah's covenant is brought forward at this crisis time. God is continuing to take care of his people despite their unfaithfulness, and he can do anything to accomplish these purposes. And at this point, he just lets them get to the place where they think they're going to die of thirst. Jehoshaphat has enough uh, uh, wise thinking about him to say, isn't there a prophet of the Lord that we can inquire and ask him? Verse number 12. Jehoshaphat said, the word of the Lord is with him. That is Elisha. So the king of Israel, Jehoram, and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to him. So they're going down to visit with Elisha. The judgment of God seems to be expected by Israel's king. The king of all the earth, that is Jehovah, continues to care for his people. They didn't get what they deserved here. God could have destroyed them completely, could have destroyed his people, could have allowed Moab to have victory and triumph over them. They will ultimately be taken captivity by the Assyrians and by the Babylonians. Jehoshaphat here understands where Israel's hope rests. And so these three kings go down to see Elisha and to seek help. Thirdly, we see that the word of the Lord comes to, again, correct and provide deliverance. What's Elisha's role here? Well, he's going to offer a corrective, and then he's going to give the direction as to what God is about to do. The word of the Lord comes to, again, correct and provide deliverance. That is the role of the prophet. Verse number 13, Elisha said unto the king of Israel, what have I to do with thee? So remember, Jehoram's the king of Israel, the king of the northern kingdom, has allowed calf worship to continue. And Elisha basically says, what do I have to do with you? Get thee to the prophets of thy father and to the prophets of thy mother. Go seek out Baal. Seek out the prophets of Baal. The king of Israel said unto him, Nay, for the Lord hath called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. So Jehoram recognizes that the prophets of Baal can't help him. Elisha continues in verse 14. Elisha said, As the Lord of the host liveth, before whom I stand, identifies himself with Yahweh. Surely, were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would not look toward thee nor see thee. I wouldn't give you a moment's attention apart from Jehoshaphat. I wouldn't even get involved here. But now bring me a minstrel. And it came to pass when the minstrel played that the hand of the Lord came upon him. It seems to reach back to 1 Samuel chapter 10 that we looked at earlier, where Saul prophesies. And during that, that interaction with the 
school of the prophets, the sons of the prophets, music is involved. Well, here he's a minstrel plays and the hand of the Lord came upon him, that is, came upon the prophet. And he said, so Elisha's going to speak now, thus saith the Lord, make this valley full of ditches. Verse 16, verse 17, for thus saith the Lord, you shall not see wind, neither shall you see rain. Yet that valley shall be filled with water. Go down there and dig ditches. You're not going to see wind. You're not going to see rain. You're not going to see a storm, but God's going to fill those ditches with water. The valley's going to be filled with water that ye may drink, both ye and your cattle and your beasts. And this is, notice verse 18, this is but a light thing in the sight of the Lord. The true God, the one true covenant God, Jehovah, this is nothing for him. He's also, verse 18, going to deliver the Moabites into your hand. And you shall smite every fenced city and every choice city and shall fell every good tree and stop all the wells of water and mar every good piece of land with stones. You're going to make sure they can't re-inhabit that land. And it came to pass, verse 20 says, in the morning when the meat offering was offered, that behold, there came water by the way of Edom and the country was filled with water. Just like God said, the word of the Lord comes to again correct and to provide deliverance. No, first of all, the impotence, the impotence of idolatrous trust. That's actually recognized by Joel Oram. Elisha says, go, go to your dad's gods, go to your mom's gods. And he says, no, Jehovah did this. Jehovah's doing this. At this point in time, the king of Israel understands who's in charge, who's the king, who's the one true God. There's an exposure by the prophet Elisha of the impotence of idolatrous trust. That is the role of this man. He's not at the center of things, but he's in the middle of things. And he wants them to understand the impotence of idolatrous trust. And secondly, the righteousness of Jehovah trust is magnified. Elisha says, here's, what's got, here's what Jehovah's going to do. Dig some ditches down there. You're not going to see the wind or the rain, but he's going to fill them with water. And then in verse 20, it simply states that's what happened. But he also said in that prophecy that these three kings are going to defeat Moab. The story goes on, verse 21. When the Moabite, when all the Moabites heard that the kings were come up to fight against them, they gathered all that were able to put on armor and upward and stood in the border. And they rose up early in the morning and the sun shone upon the water, the same water that watered the flock, the, the animals and the, the host of warriors. And the water shone on, the sun shone on the water and the Moabites saw the water on the other side as red as blood. So mixed with the red dirt, they said this, this reddish blood looking liquid. They said, verse 23, this is blood. The king's are surely slain and they have smitten one another, which we've seen in other places. Now therefore, Moab, to the spoil. He said, these guys have turned on each other. Look at the blood flowing. To the spoil. Well, verse number 24, when they came to the camp of Israel, the Israelites rose up and smote the Moabites so that they fled before them. But they went forward smiting the Moabites, even in their country. And they beat down the cities and every good piece of land, cast every man his stone and filled it. And they stopped up the wells of water and felled all the good trees. Only in Kirhath the Seth left they the stones there, thereof. Howbeit the slingers went about it and smote it. Well, the hand of the Lord came upon Elisha and Elisha said, here's what God's going to do. God's going to give you the water you need. And God is going to give you the victory over the Moabites. Verse number 20 indicates that they had a uh, an offering, a sin offering, the meat offering, when it was offered in the morning, verse 20, which seems to indicate some repentance took place among these kings. At that point in time is when God filled the country with water. And God not only provided for Israel this way, but God also defeated Moab the same way. Because when they saw it, they assumed that the kings had turned on each other. And as they rushed in to collect everything that was there, they were smitten by these kings. Well, notice verse 26, how it ends. There's a desperate, there's a desperation that takes place. Uh, when the king of Moab saw that the battle was too sore for him, he took 
him 700 men that drew swords to break through even into the king of Edom, but they could not. And he took, this was the king of Moab, took his eldest son that should have reigned in his stead and offered him for a burnt offering upon the wall. And there was great indignation against Israel and they departed from him and returned to their own land. What happened here? Well, in desperation, the king of Moab did what pagan kings do. He sacrificed his own son. That would have been the next king of Moab. He, he sacrificed him, seeking to satisfy the harsh demands of his idolatrous God. And this was so offensive and so crude, such an offensive, crude act of abomination in the extremity of his distress that it brought severe judgment on Israel from God. And Israel felt the wrath of God at this point. God had brought upon them and they just withdrew. They pulled away from the Moabites. The impotence of idolatrous trust is recognized. The righteousness of Jehovah trust is magnified. But lastly, the severity of judgment against idolatry is freshly experienced. See, God is, God is working spiritually among his people through Elisha. And even the horrors of what's happening here, when you get down to verses 26 and 27, God even uses that, this pagan king sacrificing his son to try to satisfy these impotent gods. And God turns that. And that was so abominable to God. That was offensive and crude and extreme. And I think we're seeing God use that as a testimony to Israel and Judah and Edom of what it is like to abandon the one true God and to serve the gods of the Canaanites. The severity of judgment against idolatry is freshly experienced by God's people. Much for us here. Elisha understood that he was part of what God was doing and was responsible to speak for God. God continues to work out his covenant purposes despite the fact that his people are being unfaithful. And God is warning us about any, any form of idolatry. He's demonstrating again that he is the one true God. He's Jehovah. He's the I am. He's faithful to his covenant and he expects us to be faithful, to give our lives in obedience, to live for him. Israel's testimony stands out before the New Testament people of God, that we are created by God and we are redeemed by God and we are not our own. We are bought with a price and we belong to God. As the people of God, the people of Jesus Christ, we are here to live for his glory. We are here to live in obedience to that that's righteous and pleasing to the Lord. We're to look to his word as the touchstone of what is right and wrong and what God can bless and what God, righteous God, will necessarily judge. Let's pray together. Father, we're not at the center. But in a sense, we're in the middle of what you're doing. And our prayer before you is that we will continue to watch these characters that you stand before us as we study out their lives, that we would be very careful to make application to our lives, to not in any way, shape, or form be idolatrous, to recognize that there's always going to be a Canaanite influence. There's always going to be the world around us that's going to seek to have its way with us. It's going to creep in. It's going to seep in. May we be those that stand with the Lord Jesus Christ. May we be the people of God. And we apply these things individually and as a corporate body. May you have your way with the, the whole of the people of God throughout this world. That there, there might be a return to righteousness, a return to separation, a return to holiness a return to remembering your express purposes in our lives and for our lives. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.